Okay, hello again, everyone. My name is Kevin Kelly. I'm the Director for Community Economic Development here at the Partnership. Welcome to today's webinar, which highlights one of our members in Seattle, El Centro de la Raza, which has completed a major commercial and housing development project, the Plaza Roberto Maestas, which has resulted in major community-level impact in the city's international district. Joining us today is Miguel Maestas, the Director of Housing and Economic Development at El Centro. I will now turn today's presentation over to Miguel. Hi, thank you, Kevin. Uh, first of all, I just want to say on behalf of uh, everyone at El Centro de la Raza, we are uh, very thankful and appreciative for the opportunity to share a bit about um, our work and our, our project here uh, in Seattle. Um, I'm, uh, again, Miguel Maestas, Housing and Economic Development Director. Our uh, Executive Director, Estela Ortega, was scheduled to be with us but had a, a conflict that came up and sent, she sends her apologies. So we translate El Centro de la Raza as the center for people of all races, and we're located on Beacon Hill in Seattle, Washington, uh, which is um, south of, of the downtown area. And we have been um, uh, in existence since 1972, so we're going on 48 years. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so the, the project I'll be speaking on is uh, Plaza Roberto Maestas. Um, it's named after our, um, uh, one of our organizational founders and uh, our executive director of 37 years, Roberto Maestas, who passed away back in 2010 uh, as we were beginning to come up with the concept of this development. And uh, it was a, uh, just a great amount of community uh, desire and support to uh, honor him by naming this development after him. So a, a bit about our organization before I talk about Plaza Roberto Maestas. Um, as I mentioned, we're an organization that's been around for, for thir uh, 47 years, and we were started by a peaceful occupation of an abandoned school building. Um, during that time, um, the Latino community in Seattle was growing, but there was no um, organizations that were directly serving the community. And after um, starting up an English as a second language program and then having it defunded about six months later, um, community folks gathered and asked to use a classroom in an abandoned school building to continue to voluntarily provide services to the community, but weren't having any response from the powers that be, and after um, exhausting all of their efforts, um, they uh, gathered families and students and asked to see the building and peacefully occupied it. And that occupation was uh, successful after three months. The city council voted to allow El Centro to continue using that building, uh, but it was really successful because it was a, uh, an, uh, a multiracial effort. The four gentlemen in the picture on the left include Roberto Maestas, who's uh, the second uh, third to the right. Also on the far left, Bernie White Bear, who was the director of United Indians of All Tribes. Uh, Larry Gossett, uh, who uh, was is uh, just retired as a county councilman here in, in King County. And to the far right, Bob Santos, who is uh, active in the uh, Asian and Pacific Islander community. And all of them we consider founders because they all contributed and were part of that uh, pet peaceful occupation to begin El Centro de la Raza. And, and our roots are really tied in doing everything intentionally to build multiracial unity in all of our work. <clears throat> our programs and services, now as we grew from that, from that uh, occupation back in October of 1972, uh, today we have um, 43 different programs and services. I will say that a significant part of our history uh, uh, also was the fact that as a, as a nonprofit organization, we were able to purchase the building and the property in 1998 for about 1.8 million and begin to um, you know, work to invest in the infrastructure uh, of the building. And now we have 43 um, different programs and services in the areas of human and emergency services. Uh, working, uh, we have a food bank, uh, um, emergency housing assistance, a senior program, 
children and youth programs, which includes a uh, uh, dual language multicultural child development program, uh, after school tutoring, um, cultural enrichment and academic support for in middle school and high school, uh, and, um, and our housing and economic development program, which uh, helps through um, not only our affordable housing efforts, but also um, helping people to grow and start small businesses, uh, financial empowerment, um, first-time home buyer uh, support, and other areas of, of economic development services. So another very important part of our work is uh, immigration and civil rights advocacy. We are a, we have declared ourselves a sensitive location. And what that means is that under um, uh, immigration policy or uh, immigration and custom enforcement and policy, uh, under their policy, uh, it says that uh, raids or enforcement activities will not be conducted at schools, hospitals, churches, and other things that are um, uh, declared sensitive locations. And because we are a, a school and have about 240 children on our uh, site every day, um, we fall into what is a sensitive location and have publicly declared ourselves as a sensitive location uh, for the purposes of uh, immigration enforcement. And we actually um, work uh, locally and nationally to help other um, organizations, churches, schools who um, are, do fall into the classification of a sensitive location to understand what that means. And if they're interested in publicly uh, declaring themselves a sensitive location uh, to basically support and help create a safe space for immigrant families regardless of their documentation status. We also um, do family emergency planning uh, for families that may have uh, parents who are um, undocumented to help um, basically help them create an emergency service plan in the, in the event that they are uh, detained or deported, um, creating the legal documentation so that um, their children, uh, there's a designated caregiver for children and also um, a plan, legal documentation as to who will uh, help oversee any, any assets that they have, whether it be um, property or, or, or even a business. So we do family emergency planning as well. So going to Plaza Roberto Maestas, this is an image of one of our buildings. In the back there, there's a historic, our historic school building that was built in, um, in uh, 1904 and, is, and has been El Centro de la Raza for the last 47 years. And the, and the new building there, which is one of two buildings, um, and it took, as an organization that had never um, really embarked on a development of this of this size, it took a lot of work for us to get to the point where we, as an organization, could be the developers of a, of a, of a community-inspired uh, transit-oriented development of this type. And so um, we began to engage the, uh, the neighborhood um, uh, as part of the neighborhood planning uh, and, and helped organize stakeholders to be part of those neighborhood meetings to um, give input on what type of development uh, the neighborhood would like to see. And, uh, and out of those, those neighborhood plans, which were part of the larger city neighborhood plans, um, uh, we saw that people were interested in affordable housing, um, retail space, public uh, space uh, for meetings and cultural events, uh, child care space. And so uh, we, as we then, um, learned that a light rail uh, uh, stop was coming right across the street from our, our property, uh, we then knew we had the opportunity to really um, create a development and incorporate these different elements. So over that process of about seven years, we held over 30 community meetings. We uh, made sure that all, all stakeholders were there, including um, people who were going to benefit from the affordable housing, uh, made sure that um, families and uh, particularly low-income families and, and immigrant families uh, that we serve were, were at the table, made sure that there was translation, child care, food, that people would be able to be at the meetings and, trans, and, 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 um, and participate and give input into the ultimate project that we were going to be able to create. Um, we, as far as the economic impact, 
you know, one thing that we did, which we thought was, which was very helpful and we've learned not many have done, is that we calculated out the, the, the uh, economic impact of the people that would live in, in the development. It's 112 units of affordable housing that serves people from 30 to 60 percent of median income. And we calculated about 3,000, I'm sorry, $3 million in local purchasing power and shared that with the local merchants and local businesses. And when they heard of the economic impact that um, local residents would have as far as buying groceries and buying food and getting haircuts and, and, um, and, and other things that they would uh, be um, uh, taking advantage of from local merchants, our merchants were very supportive of the of the development uh, and their support. And so we had a, a good support from local business. So the affordable housing so component, I'll talk about the different elements and obviously affordable housing is the main element. And as I mentioned, there are 112 units of affordable housing. Um, uh, 75 of those units are two and three bedroom uh, apartments. Uh, we, we wanted to create a, a development that would support families. Um, and so uh, currently the 294 total residents, 122 of, of the residents are school-aged children. Um, we offer um, after-school programs and after-school tutoring for the children that live uh, in, in, the, uh, in the development. Uh, we're 100% leased up. Um, as some may know, um, like many cities across our nation, Seattle is um, suffering from an affordability crisis as far as housing. Uh, our area that we're in, Beacon Hill, is, has suffered from uh, gentrification. So if this was part of our response as an organization to the affordable housing crisis in Seattle. Um, and on the day that we opened up ap the application process, we had over 500 families apply just on the first day. Um, for 112 units, which showed the incredible need for uh, affordable housing um, near uh, the uh, center of the city, near near where uh, many many of the jobs that people work are, and near um, public transportation. Um, this is a, a low-income housing tax credit project. Um, And I'll go to the next slide here. So one of the elements related to the affordable housing is um, obviously supporting as much as we can success of our residents. We have uh, monthly uh, tenant meetings, um, both with uh, and, and ask residents uh, to bring their uh, agenda items to the meetings and and, uh, and any any needs that they have as far as information training. Um, and share information to help um, build community. We have a system to track resident uh, data, um, which includes where tenants, where tenants moved from, the services that they take advantage of in our organization. So of those 43 services uh, that we make sure that our tenants are well aware of all of the services, whether they be our senior program, uh, child care and our child development center, uh, if they need support from the food bank, services for veterans, uh, support services for new mothers or expecting mothers, any of our services, the after-school tutoring program, any of the services that we provide, it's really making sure that we're uh, making um, tenants aware and, and connecting them with any of those services that will help them uh, be as successful as possible um, uh, uh, at, at, while they live in the development. A, a, a wonderful... Part of it is that our organization is on the same property or campus, if you will, as the as this development. So um, tenant services are easily accessible uh, by folks just walking across the the plaza to um, to our organ into the the building where we provide a, a majority of our services. <clears throat> so also another element of the development is uh, seven new classrooms of our child development program. Uh, the Jose Marti Child Deve Development Program is, a, is an award-winning, as I mentioned, dual-language, um, multicultural program. Um, every one of our uh, classrooms uh, so um, has a teacher that is has a, a, either a bachelor's or a master's degree in education or early childhood development. The, class, the classes are taught in Spanish and English, um, and children become bilingual uh, fairly quickly. 
Um, in, in the new development, in, in the historic building, there's four classrooms, and then we added seven additional classrooms in, in the new development, uh, five preschool classrooms and, and two toddler classrooms. So 240 children uh, are uh, served every day uh, through those um, 11 classrooms, uh, both in our historic building and in the new development. So part of our space also includes the Centilia Cultural Center. Um, this uh, is a, an event space that serves a, a lot of different purposes for us. It's a 3,100 square foot space that we can fit about 200 people banquet style or about 350 people if it's more of a, a reception with chairs or what have you. And we have many, many different types of events here, um, cultural events, uh, uh, community gatherings, movies. Um, this is where we have our tenant meetings, but there's a, uh, on, uh, last year in 2019, we had 220 separate events. It also includes events. We rent out the space um, to a variety of different um, organizations that do trainings or, or um, seminars or different activities, and also to private uh, parties, um, and then up for our own events and our own cultural events. But it helps us also generate a revenue stream uh, to be able to keep this space um, active. And for us as an organization, not only does it serve people that live on this property to be able to take advantage of all of the resources and the cultural events that we're able to host here, but also um, it helps bring people to the organization. So it helps bring pe uh, thousands of people every uh, year to our organization. And on this picture, if you look on the bottom floor is our cultural uh, space, the Centilia Cultural Center, which is an uh, Aztec or Nahuatl word, which means to come together and to join as one. Upstairs there is office space that is actually leased out on a long-term lease with our development consultant, Beacon Development. So this is their home as well. Um, the public plaza and Festival Street. So between the two buildings, there's a public plaza in which we're able to like extend the activities that we do out into a, 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 a plaza and a street in which we can close off the Festival Street um, and do different activities that extend out. Um, so the example, the picture there on the left is uh, like one of the uh, many uh, movie nights that we do, uh, free movie nights that we do for the community during the summertime. Uh, the middle picture there is some uh, cultural uh, cultural event that we're having in the Festival Street, um, and we have a variety of different events, including our Cinco de Mayo event, um, our Dia de los Muertos, our Day of the Dead event that incorporate all of the space. And during these activities, we also incorporate um, uh, business development or business opportunity, which I'll talk a, a bit about. But it really gives us a, a, a beautiful, wonderful indoor-outdoor space to not only uh, um, organize and, and have our own cultural events, but to make it available to other groups and organizations uh, to come and have events there as well. So, um, so we're able to uh, have other groups come and, and do events there, which just helps keep um, a really wonderful, um, vibrant um, activity there in the, in the plaza and in the festival street, particularly in the summer months. Uh, Little more diff uh, it, it winds down a bit in the winter, uh, just because of the the wet the rain that we have here in Seattle during the winter months. Uh, part of that, as I mentioned, is our financial um, empowerment and business opportunity center. So what we're able to utilize the space in an effort to help create a gathering place is we offer the plaza up to food vendors. So in the summertime, actually all year round, we have a food court out in the plaza. And these food vendors have gone through our business opportunity training have, uh, to, to develop their own businesses, to get licensed and insured, and to go through the, the, uh, the health uh, department permitting to create their own food service business. We um, rent out the the food carts at a at a, a low rate to help support businesses and provide uh, food options uh, in the food court there. And, and during the summer, we have eight different food vendors in the plaza every day. During the winter, a lot of them, they're also licensed to do catering, so they do more catering activities. But we have two food vendors that continue to work out in the plaza, a pizza vendor and a, uh, a vendor that sells ceviche. 
um, uh, throughout the year. And then we also, during our big cultural events, we provide a tianguis or a mercado, a marketplace for other table vendors that we've helped to get licensed and create their own table vending businesses. So it's a, it's a way in which we create a gathering place uh, that, that supports um, uh, our cultural events and also gives uh, economic opportunity to small uh, businesses so that we've created a place where uh, people know they can come and, and find uh, wonderful items and food and create some ec uh, economic development around the facility as well. And many of the folks, uh, some of those that are food vendors and many that are table vendors are residents of the development. Others uh, are from around the community, but many residents are able to take advantage of that as well. And then finally, the art. Um, we the the art is a is a I wanted to share this because it's a it's an important element of our development. It also is a way in which we were very intentional about um, uh, promoting our our um, principle of of uh, multiracial unity. In that we have about 50 tile mosaic murals that go around both uh, ground levels of of the development and. Um, when we first proposed art, uh, we got some pushback, and there was, you know, questions raised about how how we could um, use, you know, funding to build affordable housing to to do art because the design guidelines called for a brick facade, and brick is very beautiful, but it's also very common. It wasn't really going to separate our building or make it stand out uh, from any of the other buildings in the area that also require a brick, brick facade. So we went back and really pushed for art, and the way that we were able to get art is that we, instead of that, we we built it into the the sides of the building through uh, tile mosaic murals, and that were that were manu that were uh, created and then brought in and installed into the side of the building. Um, we we had a group of artists that represented not only the Latino community but the African American community, Native American community, Asian and Pacific Islander community. Develop the art so that it's reflective and very multicultural of uh, um, of many communities. And um, since the art has been installed, it's been up for about uh, over three years. We haven't had a single incident of of vandalism on any of the 50 tile mosaic murals. And when it was all said and done, it was more cost efficient. It was cheaper than the brick facade uh, was going to be initially. And so this um, now, when folks come and see, they really ask the question like, why don't more uh, of these type of community developments that uh, particularly um, around um, affordable housing utilize art? And you know, we share our story about how we really had to work uh, and make sure that art was a part of the development. And we know that this art has helped to create um, not only a beautiful and dignified place for people to live, but a very enjoyable, uh, attractive place for people to come and visit and spend time uh, with their families um, from around the neighborhood and around around Seattle. So those are the the uh, the major elements of the of the development that I uh, wanted to share. Um, we've been open for about three years um, and have uh, recently received um, several awards, including the Jack Kemp Award for uh, Creative through the Housing and Urban Development Institute for uh, uh, Creative Development, and we received that in 2019. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity for sh to share um, some of the elements of, of our development here in Seattle on Beacon Hill. One thing, uh, the, as I mentioned, the light rail is right across the street, so uh, tenants have access to um, to our um, our light rail uh, commuter system here in the Seattle area. Um, and at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions or talk a little bit more about in any elements that people have a, a more interest in. So thank you. Okay, um, Miguel, this is Kevin. I see one. It's a comment rather than a question. It says, this is awesome. So uh, got somebody very impressed in the audience today. I hope this, others will agree with that. I certainly would. I did have one question, maybe while I'm asking this, other people can go to the Q&A uh, box on the bottom right and, and type in some questions as well. But you talked briefly, or you mentioned the long-term housing tax credit as being part of the financing. Were there other sources of funding? Can you uh, tell people a little bit about how you're able to, to finance this project? 
Sure, that's great. We, you know, as far as the, in addition to the, the low income housing tax credit, which was a the primary source of funding, particularly for the housing elements, um, this is made up of four different areas or, or sections. So the, the child development um, uh, portion was supported through local funding through the City of Seattle Office of um, um, of, of Housing and also Child Child Development uh, Services. So we received about 1.7 million uh, from the city to help uh, construct the child development portion. Um, the commercial space, uh, which um, also what I didn't include here, and I, I and I uh, I. Forgive me, I thought I had put a slide. Is we have three commercial entities. One is a coffee shop, one is the Seattle Credit Union, which is a great partner, um, and the other is a, um, a, a restaurant, which is a taqueria called Tacos Chukis. The coffee shop and the ta and the taqueria are both family-owned businesses um, and employ people from um, from the neighborhood and including from the uh, the, ho the housing development. Um, those commercial spaces we funded through a, 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 both bridge loans and a capital campaign. We had to um, embark on the largest capital campaign um, in our history uh, about uh, raise, to raise $3.5 million to help construct the cultural event space and the commercial space, and also um, to help uh, create as, uh, to, uh, for the elements of the plaza. The plaza is um, it's open. Uh, it's not, it, we never close it. It's open to... Um, to the uh, public to come and to come and visit and enjoy any time. Um, so those are uh, di uh, different ways in which we um, were able to fund the project and put different elements of funding together. Okay, thank you for that. Hold on a second, I saw something. Else. Yeah. I know I've lost it. There's a question about is this project also available to, uh, I can, to hold on a second, I'm having some trouble with the uh, computer's not wanting to scroll down. Okay, hold, hold on just a second here. Let me, if I can get some assistance. So one other thing I'll say while you're working on that, um, Kevin, is that if it, anyone is ever in Seattle and you have some time to come and visit, we love to host tours or people that are interested in seeing the development firsthand. So um, feel free to reach out and um, if you have some time and you're in the Seattle area to come and uh, have a tour. I was trying to get this scroll down. Okay, you got a comment about loving the artwork and the murals that are incorporated into the project. Yeah, it really has helped create a very unique and oh. uh, vibrant development. Yeah, I guess the question that was, was uh, incomplete when I was looking before, this particular project also worked with those that have criminal backgrounds was the question. Well, I think that um, uh, you know, in in the as far as the housing and the and the um, you know uh, those who are applying for the housing, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that um, uh, they're under the low income housing tax credit that um, we were um, allowing people. There, there, there's basically in Seattle um, uh, regulations that. Um, here locally, it's called ban the box, but basically that people are not discriminated against based on on uh, their criminal record as far as applying for affordable housing. Um, so we were very uh, intentional intentional about making sure that um, that that was not um, something that was going to deter people um, from applying and and living at uh, Plaza Roberto Maestas. Okay, thank you, Miguel. I don't see other questions at the the moment. I guess I've got everybody. I wanted to, to mention that uh, Miguel and I were talking a little bit before we 
started the, the call, and uh, we're planning to do a tour of the site during the Seattle conference in August. So if you're coming to that, uh, keep that in mind. We'll have more details about that later on. We wanted to go ahead and, and mention that because if you're as impressed as I am with the presentation and what uh, Miguel's been saying, I think you want you want to come on that trip and be able to take a look at all of this firsthand. Um, see anything else come in? I guess, um, let me ask one other thing then, then Miguel, as I usually ask this when I talk to members about projects that they, they've done, were there any obstacles that you guys encountered along the, the way that um, maybe may take a little bit longer or any problems with anything that you might want to share, advice that you might want to give to people thinking about doing this kind of a project back in their communities? Sure, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, we I think um, one of a couple of obstacles that I'll mention. The first is that um, you know, as this, as we were getting um, ready to uh, and really getting community input on this project, you know, we had um, a couple of voices in opposition um, from the neighborhood, and um, that delayed the project for about a year. And we saw that we really had to organize and make sure that stakeholders' voices were being heard. We did an email campaign to the to the city of Seattle, to the city council, and to the mayor's office, where we had about 300 people from our community, people who were going to be applying for the affordable housing, uh, families that low-income families that we served, um, emailing uh, in support of this project. Um, and we, at, through those 30 different meetings with neighborhood uh, associations and other groups, you know, we really communicate. We, we really communicated uh, as much as possible about how about the project and all of its benefits and its impacts, uh, including like the you know getting input from people, but also sharing like what 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 the final plans were going to be, what the elements were going to be. Um, what the what the impact of construction was going to be on the neighborhood and traffic, all of the different elements of the project, including I mentioned we did the economic impact study on uh, consumer power of the of the tent of the residents, and went and knocked on every door of every business in the surrounding neighborhood and shared that information with people. Um, so we we really worked very very hard to make sure we were communicating and sharing as much information about this development as possible. And when we, we went for the final approval um, for this project um, at the uh, Architectural Review Board of the city, uh, we didn't have a single voice or, uh, or letter in opposition of the project, uh, which is pretty unprecedented uh, for, the, for a project of this size. Um, I think another thing that we learned, which is very important, is that as a small organization that had never done this level of development. We had done a smaller 14-unit affordable housing development years before, um, but we saw that um, as an organization, you know, a community action organization that does human services um, and education services, that it was incredibly important for us to be the developer, um, that there, um, and we needed to surround ourselves with um, a development consultant and architects and, and, and others who were going to support us being the developer uh, of this project, um, and and um, and because and and since then we've seen um, because of the affordable housing crisis here in Seattle we've seen many other uh, organizations, churches, uh, groups, particularly in communities of color, come to us and say we have a piece of land or we have a property and we really want to develop it, and it's really. Um, we had to work very hard to make sure that our, our policies were sound, our, our fiscal procedures were sound, that, you know, um, that we had the, uh, the financing to be able to do this project so that, honestly, that uh, the, the funders uh, um, of this project would really, um, you know, take our, our, our desire seriously to do this project. And we share those lessons, particularly with smaller organizations. Um, of how uh, you know what what you need to do in order to get a position to be a, to be able to do a project of this type. So we, um, you know, a, a lesson learned is just how much work it took for us as a, basically a you know a, a, an organ like I said a small organization based in a community of color that uh, had never done development of this type much work. 
that it took for us to be able to have capacity to develop the capacity to be able to do this development, not only to 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 the funding and finance it and construct it, but then to operate it successfully afterwards. And we'll, we really, uh, it's important to, uh, that, uh, that we feel to share um, our lessons learned on um, what it took to be able to do the project and what it took to be able to develop the capacity to, to successfully operate it. Do you have plans for any other, uh, not obviously exactly the same, but other affordable housing developments or, or anything else like that, or, or is that not cards? We actually do. We are hoping to, we're actually actively searching for uh, uh, another property to be able to um, carry out the next uh, similar type of, uh, of, uh, of multi-use affordable housing development. So definitely. Okay, very good. Okay, let me just check the chat window. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. For those who may have come on a little later than when we first started, just uh, want to point out that we are recording this and that I will send out to everybody who pre-registered a link that will have the audio as well as the PowerPoint presentation so that you can uh, have that for future benefit. We're also going to be putting this on our, our website, but I will send it out directly to those of you who are on today's call and those who signed up and were not able to make it as well. And I want to thank everybody who's on the call today and want to thank in particular Miguel for taking his time to talk about this wonderful project. And, and again, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because I want to give a little preview of Seattle and the interesting things that are going on there in our host city for the annual convention in August. And uh, again, we'll be doing a tour, so if you're interested, show up for the tour on site. So thanks again to everyone. Uh, thank you, Miguel, and uh, that's it for today. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome.